All right, so we are live now. Okay, I will. A few people uh, just joining us now, so maybe give them a, a couple minutes and then we can get started whenever you're ready, Wanma. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Well, I will share my screen if you. Yeah, go ahead. I'll uh, I'll keep an eye on the waiting room, so you can go ahead and get started. Well, um. Is everyone seeing my shared screen? Yep, looks okay, good. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the first AFO Cafe from 2024. Here we have informal science conversation about all things birds. Well, the Association of Field Ornithologists is a professional society which supports the study and conservation of birds and their natural habitats. We think ourselves as a bridge between professional and amateur ornithologists. And we are uh, having a strong focus on Latin America, supporting outreach, scient scientific meetings, and grant programs. We had uh, the um, last year the second Ornithological Congress of the Americas in Gramado, Brazil, which um, got a lot of scientists together, and it was a really ex extreme experience. This year. The AFO Cafe will have a joint meeting with the Canadian Ornithological Society and the Wilson Ornithological Society. By February 15, the workshop symposium and special event decisions will be announced. By March 15, we'll have the deadline for abstract and student travel grants and caregiver grant submissions. Uh, on March, the early bird registration will be open, still we don't have a date, and on April, still we don't have the date, but the abstract and student travel grants decisions will be communicated. By May 31, the early bird registration deadline will occur, and there will be a COVID-19 policy for the meeting no uh, communicated no later uh, April the, uh, 13th. But the abstract submission is now open you can visit the website. Also, by February 15, we have the, um, the deadline for the Bergstrom grant application for researchers from USA, Canada, for students and researchers from Latin, Latin America. The grants will be under the Scotch Research Grants, the same funds, but new with a newly organization. Well, one of the speakers of today was granted with one of these uh, research grants, so she can tell something about her experience. And also we are recruiting for a new co-editor-in-chief from the Journal of Field Ornithology. It's an, <coughs> uh, applications will be accepted through January. That's the link for the application. Also, this event is supported by Avinet Research Supplies, which sells a uh, Misnet gear and pesolas and calipers. The next AFO Cafe will be learning together for better accounting lessons from an interdisciplinary and growing project from Julieta Van Thunken and Jaime Bernardos from Inta and Katzik. There are two institutions from Argentina. They will tell about some game species monitoring in a uh, large scale in Argentina. If you want to nominate yourself or you know someone else that will, would like to speak in a future AFO Cafe, please email us with the name and subject to afo.communications at gmail.com. And if you enjoyed this experience, you can you may become a member today and support the continuation of these community engaged events. For more information, please visit our website at afonet.org. Now, presenting today's speakers. First, we have Agustina Gomez-Leitch. Dr. Agus holds a PhD in Biological Sciences 
from the National University of Mar del Plata and is currently a researcher at CONICET, Argentina's uh, Research Council. Her primary research focuses on studying the foraging behavior of seabirds with a particular emphasis on diving species by means of advanced electronic devices such as GPS, accelerometers, pressure sensors, and video cameras. And her study seeks to determine how these animals move and use their time and energy at different scales. Her research is reflected in 41 scientific publications and presentations at both national and international conferences. And next to her, Montserrat del Caño, Monse holds a degree in biological sciences from the National University of Patagonia, San Juan eh, Bosco. She's currently a doctoral fellow at CONICET and is a PhD student in biological sciences at the National University of Comahue. She also holds a Bergstrom Award. Her doctoral research focuses on the use of accelerometry for the analysis of food provisioning and begging behavior in birds, and specifically Montserrat's thesis aims to investigate the effect of sex of, of sex on food contribution to the nest and to study for the begging and acquisition behavior of chicks. Her methodology involves using advanced ele electronic devices such as accelerometers to collect precise data on how birds move and behave while feeding. Prior to her current research focus, Montserrat used accelerometers to study prey capture at Megashanic penguins. Now, Agus and Monse, it's your turn. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I will Let's stop sharing. Yeah. It's up to you. Okay. Share. Let me put my presentation first. Uh, wait. Now, everyone else, uh, yeah. Monse and I will please mute your microphones. Is it okay? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Thank, thanks, Juanma, for your kind and warm introduction. And thanks all the organizers of the AFO Cafe for inviting Monse and, and me to, to give this talk. It's really an honor for us to be here sharing part of our work with you today. But I thought it would be interesting to start the talk with this illustration that I adapted because the original one has a mammal. So <laughs> I changed the mammal for a bird. And it shows the difference between the information we could get from traditional tracking methodologies and the information we can get today by advances in technology. Traditionally, we could get only a few positions of the animals, and that allowed us to have a general idea of how they were used in space. Today, by means of different sensors, we can get a high resolution information about how they move. Uh, we can also get information about the, the environment in which, in which they are moving. And we can even study interactions between species or between animals from the same species. In the present talk, I will focus on two sensors that are accelerometers and magnetometers. And the ends of the, of the talk are to introduce these two sensors to share the advantages and limitations each one of them has, to highlight the advantages that they provide if they are used together, to illustrate the role of the frequency in which we uh, program the sensors to get data uh, according to the question we have in mind, show how type placement and attachment can affect the information we get. And uh, then Mose will show, uh, will show us an example of the potential of accelerometry to study particularly two behaviors that are uh, food provisioning and chick begging and acquisition of food. Let's start with accelerometers. Um, accelerometers measure the change in speed in three space dimensions. They allowed us to study how an animal moves in the dorsal ventral dimension, that is called hip, in the anterior posterior, or search, and in a lateral way, that is called sway. 
The total acceleration registered by these sensors in each of the three axes consists of two components. The static component, that is due to the Earth's gravitational field, and the dynamic acceleration com component that give us, uh, give us information about the motion of the animal that has the tag. These two components can be isolated from the raw acceleration data using generally a running mean of two or three seconds. So what does the static acceleration information uh, uh, says? It gives us uh, an idea of two uh, principal angles that are the pitch angle and the roll angle. The pitch angle indicates if an animal is pointed up or, or pointing down. For example, if we are studying a penguin that is diving, we would, we would see that pitch angles are negative when the penguin is going down the water column and positive when it's going up to the surface. The roll angle gives us information about the rotation of the animal around the lateral axis. On the contrary, the dynamic acceleration component gives us information about the movement of the animal. For example, the flapping frequency or intensity of a bird, like we can see in this figure. I will use my, like we can see here. Uh, this, this shows how the one of the uh, axis, that is the dorsal ventral axis, uh, registers information about the, the flapping frequency of a flying bird. Um, as an example of the information that these acceleration signals give us, um, I will talk a little bit about this work we did some years ago in which our question was to determine if ringing cormorants, imperial cormorants in this case, with links, with rings in, in on their foot, on their legs, um, affected the, the diving performance. So we put uh, accelerometers on two groups of birds, one group uh, carrying rings and uh, another one without rings. And then we studied how these birds um, dived, especially we focus on the, on the descent phase. That is, as you can see here in this figure, this is a, a typical cormorant dive. This is the acceleration data of one channel of the heat channel. And here you can see how the bird moves when it's descending on the water column, when it's swimming along the bottom of the dive, and when it's ascending. We focus on the descent phase because it's where when cormorants spend more, more energy because they have to um, work against the, the up, 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 down, up force of the because of buoyancy. So we focus on this phase and we saw that the number of kicks of ring and unring animals uh, didn't vary. This is uh, the number of kicks um, at different depths of always the descent phase of females and males. However, the kick amplitude vary between ring and unring birds. And the general thing that we saw in this study is that Although rings didn't affect the diving performance a lot, they only um, increment the amount of work birds had to do in 3.5%. It's important to take this into account because birds have rings for their entire life. Um, um, the dynamic component of acceleration can be also used to study the energy expenditure of, of the animals. Um, the dynamic, this is, is done by calculating two metrics that are called bed bar, uh, that is overload dynamic body acceleration, and uh, odd bar, sorry, odd bar, and bed bar, that is the vectorial sum of dynamic body acceleration. As you can see in this figure, both metrics are highly correlated. And these metrics um, are useful as a proxy of energy expenditure when we want to study the amount of energy animals spend while they move. If we want to analyze uh, 
the amount of energy an animal spends while it's not moving, acceleration wouldn't be a, a good technique. Um, and well, in this figure, what we can see is um, the relationship between OTPA and the rate of oxygen consumption in a number of species. We see that the relationship is, is very good and that it depends or it changes according to species, which is also important because we cannot use one relation, one the relationship from one species uh, to, to make this conversion with another species. And now I'm going to talk about some factors that affect the, the data we get from the accelerometers. One of them is a uh, tag stability. When we use these sensors, it's very important to um, attach the devices uh, uh, very good to the animal and prevent them from moving independently. Because if not, we are not going to record the movement of the animal, but the, the movement of the device that sometimes is independent of the movement of the animal. Uh, another thing is uh, the, the position of the tag. Um, as we can see in this figure uh, that shows a smooth bed bar against time, the values of bed bar uh, change if we place the device uh, on the lower back or on the upper back of a pigeon. So the important thing to consider here is that if we want to make comparisons between animals, it's important to place the tag always in the same place. Also taking advantage of the fact that placing the device in different places of the animal body, we uh, did this work that I have the opportunity also to, to be part of it in which the, the question was how penguins, hygienic penguins in this case, and imperial cormorants moved their body and their head while they were looking for food during their dives. So what we did was to place an accelerometer on the head and on the body of each one of these bird species. And we studied the movement along the different phases of, the, of their dives. What we see here is that in penguins, the movement in the three phases of the dives is very similar between the, the head and the body. However, for cormorants, while they are looking for food, um, they move their head much more than their body. And this would be possible because of the long uh, neck cormorants have. And this would allow them to move their head independently of their body and spend less, less energy that, than if they had to move all their body in, in this way to look for food. Another factor to take into account when using acceler accelerometers is um, what is called environmental bed bar. What we can see here is the bed bar from a cormorant that was floating on a C state three and on a C state five. And we can see that the bed bar uh, values change a lot. And this is not because of the movement of the bird, but because of the movement of the waves in different C states. Um, the, as regards frequency, it's very important to, to have in mind what's the frequency of the behavior we want to study. And the general rule is to program the devices um, at least twice that they should record data twice as frequent as the frequency of the behavior we want to study. For example, here, this is uh, some data from a uh, imperial cormorant flying and the frequency mm -hmm or the wind beat frequency of these animals is on average 5.5 uh, Hertz. So we can see that if we set uh, the devices to record at 50 Hertz, we can get the wind beat frequency correctly. If we set the devices to record at 25, uh, it's okay, it's also okay. However, if we set the devices to record at 10 or five Hertz in pink or in brown, it's not enough to get the wind bit frequency. Now I'm going to talk briefly about magnetometers. Uh, magnetometers measure changes in the Earth's magnetic field, and they give us information about 
the orientation of the animal respect to the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, this is an important difference between magnetometers and, and accelerometers, because accelerometers don't uh, give us information about uh, the direction of movement. We can, we can know, for example, by studying uh, a signal, if an animal is walking or, or swimming or flying, for example, but we cannot have information, we don't have information with accelerometers about the direction. We don't know if the animal is walking south, north, east, west. Um, uh, contrary to accelerometers, uh, magnetometers are less sensitive to the place uh, where they are placed uh, on the body of the animal, and they are subject to errors um, because of errors of irons in the magnetic field that is close to the magnetometer. That's why it's very important to calibrate magnetometers be before uh, they are attached to, to the animals. And what information can magnetometers uh, give us uh, that acceler acceleration doesn't give us? For example, in this study uh, in the Andean condor, um, the information provided by, by magnetometers was um, better than the one provided by accelerometers because condors don't flap a lot while they while they fly. They only flap 1% of their flying time, especially when they are taking off or when they are close to the ground. So if we see here in this figure, the acceleration signal is almost the same for all these types of flying. However, magnetometry data differs um, between periods when the bird is going up a slope, when it's gliding, or when it's circling around a, a term. And what if we place both sensors together? Well, if we use both sensors together, we can reconstruct animal uh, movement tracks at very uh, precise, so at very small scale. Um, additionally, by placing both both sensors together, we can get information about behavior that maybe one sensor, sensor doesn't give us. Um, um, as regards the reconstruction of animal movement paths uh, by using both sensors, uh, the method that is used is called dead reckoning. And the magnetometer magnetometers give us information about heading, while the accelerometers, by means of a proxy of PID, uh, BEDPA, um, give us information about speed. So by using these uh, two sources of information, we can reconstruct animal tracks, uh, even in situations where we cannot use a GPS. For example, we can reconstruct animal tracks underwater uh, in a dense forest or where wild animals are moving in caves. Um, one of the things that this dead reckoning technique uh, has, or one of the limitation, is that it suffers a drift, so it accumulates errors uh, across time. So uh, it's important to ground through some the positions um, with another source of uh, positioning data, for example, a GPS or telemetry or direct observations. If you want to, uh, or if you are interested in this particular uh, topic, uh, you can uh, read this paper in which it also provides a, a, a function in R to reconstruct drugs using that reckoning and to uh, correct them using another source like a GPS. This is an example of a, an underwater reconstructed track from a cormorant. Um, in blue, we can see the, the descent phase of a dive, in green, the bottom phase, and in red, the ascent phase. We can see how the tortuosity of the track is, is higher in the bottom phase, that is where, where animals uh, usually uh, capture prey. And this allows us, for example, to study how tortuosity changes between uh, animals from that have different experience between sexes, 
between different places of, of the ocean where we expect different um, concentration of prey or different type of prey. And finally, in these two slides, uh, I will show you two simple ways of identifying behaviors uh, from uh, acceleration data. I'm going to, the, the examples are uh, with acceleration data, but the same methods can be applied with, with uh, magnetometer data. Um, this example, uh, here we can see the, the head, uh, the heap axis again, uh, of a flying kittiwake and a non-flying, so the same bird uh, that is not flying here and flying here. We can see that the signal is very different. And here we can see the standard deviation of this heap channel. Um, and if we uh, build a, a distribution histogram of this, we can see that it has a clear bimodal distribution. So by using a threshold, of uh, 0 0.4 in this occasion, um, the accuracy of assignment flying and non-flying behavior in, in these birds, in, in six birds of these species, was 98%. Uh, this is a very simple way of classifying behavior. It's, um, it, it's very useful when, when the signal between behaviors is very different. There are some occasions in which it's not as different as you will see in Moses, uh, in Moses examples. And finally, um, this is another method that um, this was a part of Moses undergraduate thesis in which we applied an algorithm, a relatively simple algorithm that is called the uh, uh, nearest neighbors or KNN, -K <laughs> um, and what, what we wanted to do is to to determine by, by acceleration signals uh, the moments in which myogenic penguins uh, capture prey. So we had body acceleration data and head acceleration data from moments in which birds were swimming and from uh, moments where birds with, were capturing data. We know when they were capturing data and when they were swimming because these birds all also had cameras. Um, I didn't say it, but this algorithm is a supervised cl classifier. So what we need to train the model with label data, data, data that we know that belongs to a specific behavior. So we train the model with uh, all the features. That means features coming from the body data, the head data, and depth. Then we train the, the model, another model with body and depth features. And finally, we train a third model only with head features. And we saw that all the models had a high accuracy and that the accuracy was uh, higher uh, when we used uh, all the features. And well, that's <laughs> uh, after this uh, general overview, uh, I leave you with, with Nos. Thank you, Austina. And good afternoon to all. Well, to commence, I would like to highlight the importance of studying food provisioning and mating behavior in birds. Both behaviors are central in avian reproductive ecology because they influence the reproductive success of adults and the development and survival of the chicks. So these behaviors reveal patterns within interactions among parents and, for example, between parents and chicks. So investigating uh, them allow us, for instance, to identify factors influencing food distribution, uh, analyze whether the degree of parental uh, cooperation differs between sexes, and even determine how chick competition impacts in the access to a food, among uh, other aspects. How can you? Uh, well, accelerometers can be used to detect the, and quantify uh, these behaviors. As Austina mentioned uh, before in her presentation, this tool allows for detailed examination of behaviors and allows continuous recording of behavior, behavior data uh, over extended periods. So until now, 
this tool has not been used in the study of food provisioning or begging behaviors. But uh, to address, before to address more complex uh, theoretical questions, first, the methodology needs to be refined and we need to explore the potential of the methodology. So in line with this, uh, the imperial shark is an excellent model species for study the, these behaviors using accelerometers because of the remarkable movement that both adults produce when they provide food to their chicks and because of the remarkable movements that chicks display when they beg for food to their parents. So uh, here uh, in this uh, presentation, I am going to show you some advances of my doctoral thesis, which I am developing in the laboratory of marine top predators and my uh, advisors are, uh, well, Austina gomez Leitch and uh, Flavio Quintana. Well, so using the imperial cormorant, uh, sorry, the imperial child <laughs> as a model species, I will show you by placing, uh, how by placing accelerometers uh, on the head of adult birds, we can identify and quantify food, food provisioning behaviors. Then, I will present you how by measuring the head movement of adults when they provide food to, uh, to the chicks, we can estimate the amount of food they deliver. And finally, I will present you some preliminary results uh, that we obtained from the analysis of chicks begging, uh, chicks begging and food acquisition uh, acceleration signals. Okay, in the first uh, work, we place accelerometers on uh, adult imperial shark uh, heads, and they allow us to identify the, acceler the, acceler the acceleration signals corresponding to the food provisioning behaviors. In the following uh, graph, we observe examples of electronic signals recorded, recorded uh, by accelerometers. The intervals between the dashed lines corresponds to the moments when an adult is feeding a chick. So here uh, we present three, exam three signals uh, examples, each corresponding to chicks in different age categories. For example, the category A includes chicks less than seven days old. The category B uh, comprises chicks between eight and uh, 14 uh, days old. And the category C comprises chicks between 15 and 21 days old. So in general, uh, we can see that the signals are more intense and prolonged uh, in older chicks. Well, in order to classify automatically food provisioning events from accelerometry data, what we did is we trained three support vector machines uh, models one for each uh, age category of chicks. The performance, uh, the performance of the models show accuracy values greater than 90%. This refers to the, uh, the correct number of predictions that the model did. And as we expected, the predictions of the models improve with the age of the chicks. So this means that the algorithm is more efficient at recognizing provisional, uh, provisioning event signals in older chicks. Well, in the second case, we evaluate the utility of acceleration data for uh, estimating the amount of food transferred to the chicks. Considering that uh, an adult feeding the chicks makes more intense or long lasting head movements as, as the amount of food delivered to the chicks increases. So we suggest that there is a correlation between head movements and the amount of regurgitated food. So we measure these uh, movements using accelerometers and we estimate the quantity of food delivered. To answer these questions, we record the weight of the chicks before and after 
uh, being fed by the adults. So the body, uh, the body mass gain then uh, was used as a measure of the amount of food delivered by the adult to each chick. Then we calculate different metrics from the acceleration signals obtained during the adult's provisional behaviors. So we calculate uh, the duration of the signals. We calculate the mean beta of the signals. Beta is a proxy of the energy, energy expenditure. And uh, we also calculate the standard deviation of the acceleration channels. And we consider this metric as a measure of movement intensity. We found um, a significant relationship uh, between chick body mass gain and the total time that the chick was, uh, was fed by, by the adult. We uh, also observed that it was in a strong relationship between the combination of time and VEDBA. And then uh, in the, the last graphic, graphic C, we can see that uh, we also found a relationship between the intensity of the lateral movement when the adult feeds uh, uh, is related with a, a greater chick body mass gain. Ah, yes, the next one. Thank you. Well, finally, uh, here you will see some preliminary results in which we demonstrate how we can uh, use accelerometry to identify begging and food acquisition behaviors in imperial shark chicks. So we instrument chicks between eight and 18 days uh, old uh, with accelerometers uh, on their heads and uh, we, in order to obtain uh, the signals related to begging and food acquisition. And now you will see uh, in this video uh, that there are two instrumented chicks. But now we, please pay attention to one chick, to the blue painted chick. Uh, okay. Well, these chicks, who moves its head uh, and neck in an energy way uh, is begging food. And now on the right hand side in the graphic, you are now observing the acceleration signal of this chick now. Okay, this signal corresponds to the begging behavior. And now uh, in the video, we can see that the chick, the same chick, uh, inserting its head into the adult's mouth to obtain the uh, regurgitated food. And now, uh, if you see the graphic, you can see uh, how the acceleration signal of this behavior looks like. That one. Well, then uh, we also use the acceleration uh, data the, the, from these behaviors uh, to train the a random forest algorithm, which uh, shows good performance in classifying behaviors with accuracy, precision, and recall uh, values uh, uh, about 98%. However, these results are preliminary because we plan to add uh, more behavior categories to the, the classifier and possibly uh, we plan to increase the number of individuals. So, well, uh, thank you for your attention and for your participation. And I would like to express a gratitude to the AFO founding I received in 2021, which made much of this work possible. Uh, well, and I'm, uh, now I am open to answering any question uh, you may have. Thank you. Before before the questions, I would also want to to thank uh, the the fundings. 
eh, CONICET, eh, la Agencia Nacional de Promoción Científica y Tecnológica, Tecnosmart, eh, SLAM, eh, ANAFO y Aves Argentinas por the grants that they gave to, to Monse. And the last slide, eh, you can eh, see our contacts in, and also the, the lab web pages if you want to look for more information about our projects or other projects. Thank you to all. I hope you enjoyed. And yes, now we are ready for the questions. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, so everyone, uh, feel free to turn on your cameras and microphones. And if you have any questions, um, we've got lots of time to, to chat yet about some really cool research. <laughs> Thank you. And for people who are watching it uh, live stream in YouTube, you can also type your questions on the chat and we will read them here. I did have a question about the uh, machines you use, the, the little measuring machines. Are there ways for those to be sustainable? Do you reuse them or is that, or are they just kind of a one and done kind of machine? Uh, I, I don't know if I, if I understood, if we reuse them, if we use them several times, that that's the question. Yes, the machines, can you reuse those on several different birds? Yes, or... yes, yeah, yes, 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 yes. we got uh, for, for example, the, the devices we are using on, on cormorants, on adults and chicks, some of them have more than five years. So yes, we can we can use them. It's, it's interesting because it's important to maintain them. And for example, if you use them uh, during one field season and then the next field season is a year after, uh, you have to keep in mind that it's important to charge the devices every four months to, to keep the battery. If not, uh, they they lose power and, and they live less. <laughs> That's interesting, thank you. Uh, I was wondering um, if you're trying to make some kind of maybe future research uh, to see if the um, how how you register the begging behavior of nestlings and their their survival after abandoning the nest to see if there's some kind of balance of investing too much energy in begging for food how they receive that food and their survival after that. Mose, do you want to answer that? Uh, Yes, I think that you can, yes, you can do that because you know all this information from the acceleration data. So yes, you can do, make this uh, relation then, relationship then. And I, I'm maybe uh, Walter Schwagel may have uh, thought about it, but uh, have, have you uh, done any connection between their begging behavior and their growth after that? No, no, not now. No, not that yet. Would be a, no. That would yeah, be a, no, an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because we may infer that a strong begging may have some impacts on the growth of the cheeks. In the row, yes. But, mm -hmm. but I I think very little people may have measured their, be their begging behavior with the detail you are doing it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because you got you put the accelerometer on the head of the chicks, and you can know, for example, the intensity of that movement when they beg for food. So then you can relate this information with the growth. Yes, in a yes. super detail. You can you can compare the, the the intensity between siblings in the same nest, and mm -hmm. um, yes, okay. there are many questions that can be answered. Maybe the, the focus of Monse's thesis is to um, refine the methodology uh, first. To define, yes, the methodology that that takes a, a lot of time because the, the, the most interesting things come afterwards. But before we need to, to see how, how to 
yes, how many questions uh, this technique allows us to answer. And it was yeah. also uh, interesting to put accelerometers on cheeks for the first time. Uh, it was really challenging and well, yes. uh, it, it, uh, it worked. So we, we are really happy with that. Thank you for your answer. Uh, it's Taylor Schimek who has a question here. Uh, the question is, what are the limitations on the devices in terms of distance? Do they store the data and you have to download it or is it transmitted to a separate device? I'm thinking in particular of tracking birds on their migratory routes. In our case, we download the data. We recover the device from the from the animals and then download the data. But I think I was, there are a lot yes. of uh, another, yes, devices yes, and you can do that. You can download the data remotely also. Uh, yes. For our questions, that, that's not necessary. And uh, in the colony where we are working, uh, it's uh, easy to, to reca recapture the, the birds and get the devices back. But it's possible to, to download the data remotely. Yes. Any other questions? What are the, I guess I'm curious, um, this is really, really interesting technology. And I'm curious um, how large the devices are and, and the size of the birds that you're able to get them on. Like what is the smallest bird that can hold these devices at this time? Yes, the devices that we have uh, are the size of a fingernail. Oh, okay. And they, yes, and they weigh uh, two grams. Oh. But, and we only instrument chicks uh, between eight, uh, more than uh, eight days old, because until now we don't have uh, devices small enough to instrument uh, younger chicks, but there are more uh, smaller, uh, small devices in the, I have, how do you say? You, you can uh, buy like uh, small devices. Uh, yes, th there are some some devices that weigh less than one gram. Okay. Uh, the limitation in most of the time the times now is the battery. It's not the, the sensor. The sensor is very small, but these devices that weigh less than one gram in they are like low power devices. So you can get data or you activate the device to record data when the acceleration signal uh, passes a certain threshold and then it stops. And what we are using now uh, gets data continuously. And they are two grams, they, they weigh two grams and they can last more than two days uh, registering data at 50 Hertz. Okay. But it's a, for us, it's a lot. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm also, well, it's just curiosity of, of myself, but I don't know if you already said it, but do you have like, or did you try to connect uh, data from the accelerometer and try to predict the type of prey they are catching? Mm. No, the they are diving. The, yes, while sorry. you are diving. No, not yet. Because it's it's not been easy to identify when they capture prey. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I work with that with with a machine learning algorithm, and uh, the 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 accuracy is seventy percent more or less. It's not bad, but. Uh, we need to improve that and then try to see if the signal differs uh, mm. between uh, the prey they are capturing. Um, yes. yes I, I'm not sure what kind of prey they capture, but I, I think they uh, just fish or they also capture the mollusks or crustaceans. Or they're just a uh, piece, piece of 
mostly fish, but sometimes they capture a uh, shrimp or octopus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of the time in this particular colony, they feed while they are uh, swimming at the bottom. Uh, but in some occasions, they also feed uh, on pelagic prey. So the signal mm -hmm. between pelagic and bottom prey uh, must be different. Yes, but uh, between different kinds of prey that they find at the bottom, maybe it is, but, but maybe it's a little bit more difficult to, to find the differences, but it's not impossible, I think. <laughs> no, I, I think it might be interesting to see if there are some kind of ecological conditions that may, um, may, may make a bentonic prey more... Uh, available than pelagic praise it's just you know brainstorming <laughs> ideas um it's like uh, for example for for cormorants it's more expensive to 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 swim i had i at high speeds that for penguins uh, and um that's one of the reasons why they they feed on bottom prey that moves less mm -hmm. And it's more predictable in in space and time. Uh, yes, and particularly in this colony, they 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 eat uh, mostly in the bottom. Uh, but there are other cormorant species that uh, prey on pelagic fish. Yes. Okay. Yes, there are many many op many open questions having this technology available and tuned by you. <laughs> I don't know if there's any 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 anyone with another question. I'm watching the YouTube channel, but no questions yet there. All right. Well, I guess with that. Um... Thank you both again, Montserrat and Augustina. Um, really, really interesting research. So thank you for taking the time to share it with us today. Um, thanks to everybody joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your weekend or your upcoming weekend. And we hope to see you in February for the next AFO Cafe. Thank you again. Thank you very it much. Was, it was a, a pleasure to share our work with you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye, everyone, and also, as Matt said, have a nice weekend. Good job.